Throughout this week, we've been looking at how we can describe the sounds of human languages. We've been looking at consonants and vowels, other phenomena like aspiration, vowel length, nasality, and so forth. But there is one question that we haven't answered throughout the week. How much detail do we need when we write our phonetic transcriptions? You can have something like the picture on the left, where you have, take that, you scoundrel. There's a lot of detail going on there. You can have a transcription like the one on the right that also says, take that, you scoundrel, with a little bit less detail. So when do you need something that is broader, like the one on the right, or narrower, like the one on the left? It depends. It depends on the phenomenon that you are describing. Maybe it's a small difference and you do need to provide a lot of detail. Maybe you're describing the phonology of a language with broad strokes, and so you don't need to provide as much phonetic detail. This is the difference between a broad transcription on the right and a narrow transcription on the left. And before we continue, I just want to show you how much you've learned this week. This is the International Phonetic Alphabet, and we've seen how there are consonants, so I've described like place of articulation and manner of articulation. We've looked at ingressive sounds, uh, the ones where air goes in. We've looked at diacritics that modify the symbols. In English, we have aspiration, for example. Um, we've also looked at vowels and how you can describe them by whether your tongue is high, mid, low, whether your tongue is front, center, back. We looked at tones and how tones be, can be high, mid, and low. So we've gone through much of the table. And one question you might have is, why are we studying all of this? We're studying this because the table reveals patterns. Maybe there's a series of sounds that are alveolar. Maybe there's a series of sounds that are all fricative. And maybe there's vowels that share some feature, for example, being front. You might remember this from our first week where we looked at some words in Latin and how they ended up being pronounced in English. Some words had a sound K, like centrum, certus, circulus, and civitas. And those Ks ended up being sounding like an S in English, as in center, certitude, circle, city. So we have a small rule like this, like a K, the Latin K becomes an English S whenever it happens before an E or an I. However, we can further simplify this to see that there's something that these two have in common. They are front vowels. The change happened because um, a K in front of a front vowel makes your tongue move forward. The front vowel requires your tongue to move uh, like to the front a little bit. And this drags your tongue from the position of the K, which is a little bit further back, forward onto a position that eventually became like the one in the S. So that's how the fronting of the vowels changed a sound. And we can see that because we can see patterns that unify them. And we see that through the International Phonetic Alphabet. So English. English is an amazing language in that there's a lot of variation in its vowels. Everyone speaks a different dialect of English. There's even though you might think there's a standard version of English, the truth is the standard is like an agreed upon version that everyone um, maybe projects on TV or in movies and so forth, but no one is born speaking standard English. Every single speaker of English has its own, their own dialect. And so every one of them sounds a little bit different. And by the way, this is true of all languages, but English has a lot of variation in the vowels. Take a look at these vowels. Long. 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 Wow, those are different. Um, by the way, just so um, you know what they're here, you, you know what these symbols are. This means that this is done with less rounding. Is the uh, all but with your lips a little bit less rounded. This one means that the vowel is centralized, so. Lang. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. 
Lang. This little symbol here means that the aw is lowered. Long. And as we know, this one means that the vowel is long. This one means that it's half long. Long. So these are a lot of details. And maybe if you're doing research on New Zealand English or the differences between uh, the South and the North of the US, you might need to provide all of these details. But if you just want to transcribe a word in English in a general form, you could use a broader transcription. For example, with this consonant, um, you can uh, take for granted that it's an L and avoid giving us the detail of whether it's dark or light. With this vowel, you can um, sort of pronounce it like long. And if you need it, you can then provide details of how some speakers make it further down, some speakers have it further to the center, and so forth. So long is a good broad description of this word for English. And if you need a narrower description, you can see, uh, you can take a look at someone's specifics. This is another example of how different words are in English depending on the dialect. By the way, AAVE is African American Vernacular English. This is the word seven in different parts of the English speaking world. Oh. Seven. 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 All of them are very different. And by the way, this one is important that I do want you to, to learn it. This little line underneath an N means that it's a syllabic N, as in seven. Seven. So the actual syllable there is the second syllable is vn, vn. This is the same. Uh, so the n there is functioning as a vowel. It's the same vowel as in the word mutton or cotton. Mm. So the n there is is uh, doing the work of a vowel. So many different sevens. You could go into a narrower description, but if you need a broad this uh, broad transcription, seven would be enough. Let's listen to variations of the word with, uh, which broadly transcribed would be 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. So the broad transcription ignores, for example, whether the consonant is aspirated or not ignores uh, whether there's one, there's a monophthong or a, a, like a long diphthong in these cases, for example. But again, if you're studying syntax or morphology, maybe a broad transcription would be enough. If you're studying phonetic details of uh, dialects of the United States, then you do need to go into more detail. Oh, and by the way, yes, no, that's good. <laughs> this is the other sim symbol that I wanted. Take a look at examples for four. 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 All of them very different. And by the way, I want you to look at this symbol. This is a schwa with a roticity symbol. It means that as you're producing the schwa, your tongue is also in the position to do an R. So this is a roticized schwa. And it means and it sounds like four, four, four. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're studying, for example, uh, how R's uh, exist or not in dialects of English, then you might need a lot of narrow transcriptions. But if you're only interested in a general description of the word, four will do the trick. What are we going to do? It depends. Researchers, again, might need a narrower transcription if they're studying some detail in phonetics, or they might use a broader transcription if they don't need to know, focus on phonetics at the time, maybe they're focusing on syntax or morphology. So it, uh, what, uh, which one are you going to use, narrow or broad? It depends. In class, it will be fine if we use broad transcriptions, but we also understand that all of you have different dialects of English, and your uh, sounds for each of these vowels might be different. So we are obviously going to be uh, attuned to that, that there's going to be quite a bit of variation in how we transcribe these. 
In summary, a narrow transcription encodes as much phonetic detail as you need for the research you're doing. A broad transcription maybe leaves some of the details out because you're describing something that doesn't depend on that specific symbol. For example, if you're not studying aspiration, maybe you don't need the aspiration symbol. Both of these are useful linguists, depending on what we need. And nobody speaks standard. Everyone speaks a dialect of English that uh, they grew up speaking or that they have learned. And so trying to reach for these like standard symbols is maybe only possible in the broad transcription. But if you take a look at all of us, we all have a dialect of English that we speak.